Imperium by Robert Harris, book review. Uh, so this is one of my scripted book review series, and the, the project here is I'm going through my old blog archives and uh, just making YouTube videos out of book reviews I wrote years ago, for whatever it's worth. <clears throat> Um, it's interesting kind of going through these sometimes because sometimes you find you've changed your opinion on stuff. Uh, this is one of those cases, kind of. I wrote this book review in 2006 and had a very harsh view of uh, this book. I've not reread this book in the years since, but I have read the other two books in the trilogy. Uh, this is kind of a three book trilogy on the life of Cicero. Uh, and I really enjoyed the second and third books, which have caused me to kind of think maybe I was a little bit too harsh on the first book. Um, on the other hand, kind of looking at this, I do kind of still stand by all the criticisms I made of the first book. Um, I think the big thing I never emphasized, though, in my original review is that the book was just readable. Like, the, the prose was easy to read, it kind of flowed very nicely. Uh, and so for all its faults, and it does have some faults, I think that is kind of one positive I just forgot to mention. It's an incredibly readable little book, even if you can kind of nitpick a lot of stuff on it. So uh, this is a book. It's a historical fiction about the life of Cicero. Uh, I picked this up because I had just gotten done reading uh, the Masters of Rome series by Colleen McAuliffe, uh, having finished October Horse. And, uh, you know, when I'm in the zone of something, I'm in the zone, right? My interest was kindled again. I was looking to read some kind of more historical fiction on this era. And then I saw this book. So this is a first in a trilogy, historical fiction on the life of Cicero. Um, the conceit of the book is that it's the life of Cicero as told from the perspective of his secretary, Tiro. Now, according to the author's note at the end, and Wikipedia backs this up, Cicero's secretary, Tiro, actually did write a biography of Cicero. And it's a real shame that we don't have it anymore. I guess that it was lost with the collapse of the Roman Empire and kind of all the other historical stuff that got lost during this, this period. Um, now, this first volume, Imperium, is 300 pages. Uh, so it's quite short. It's, it's a lot, for example, comparing it to Colleen McCullough's Masters of Rome series is a lot shorter than any of her books covering the same period. Um, back in 2006, when there was only Imperium available, in my edition at least, nowhere did it say anywhere that this is part of a planned trilogy. Although it, it was, it turned out to be a trilogy. Um, but back in 2006 with my edition, I was just kind of guessing that this must be part of the trilogy, uh, because the book ends right when Cicero becomes consul for the first time. So all of the major, most of the major events in Cicero's life have yet to come when this book ends. Uh, the book has a lot of flaws, but I'm so much a fan of historical fiction, and I'm so interested in this time period that I was interested in the book despite all its flaws. And as I wrote in 2006, I fully plan on reading the sequels to this book when they come out. And in fact, I have. Um, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of problems with this book. For reasons that are mystifying to me, this book got a lot of good reviews. So like if you search like the professional book reviewers, they all like the book. Um, maybe that just proves I'm the one who doesn't know what I'm talking about. I don't know. Uh, I was coming off of this fresh from Colleen McCullough's series. So that was my point of comparison. And maybe this is gonna be a little bit uh, 
mystifying to somebody else who doesn't have the same point of comparison. But in Colleen McAuliffe's series, she starts off, we first meet Cicero when he's just a 17-year-old serving as an internship in Pompey Strabo's army. And we follow him as he kind of makes his first appearances in Rome, makes his, takes his first court case, he meets Atticus for the first time. Uh, now Cicero is only one of many characters that Colleen McAuliffe is juggling, but we kind of see that progression all the way from young Cicero to kind of him kind of making his scene at the first time. In Robert Harris's book, we start with Cicero is already 30. And I don't understand why he did that. Because the, the narrator, Tiro, uh, has been with Cicero since childhood. And that's quite explicitly stated in the book. So why not, yeah, I don't, why not just kind of cover the main events of Cicero's young life? I, I don't know why they didn't do that. But all of Cicero's life, up to 30, is just covered in a few paragraphs of backstory. His time in the army, uh, his famous case defending a client accused of patricide, which was like apparently a really big deal at the time, almost virtually, virtually ignored in this book. So there is some great opportunity to kind of add some depth to the character and interest, which are just kind of lost. The other major quibble I had with this book is that there are a lot of supporting characters in Imperium. People who support Cicero in his political career. There's his friend Atticus. There's his younger brother Quintus. There's Cicero's cousin Lucius. His protege, Frugi, uh, etc. Now, these characters are present in most of the big scenes. Uh, apparently, they've got nothing better to do than to just follow Cicero around from place to place. But in spite of them being present all the time, none of them are developed at all. Uh, and so they become nothing more to the reader than just a bunch of names to keep track of. And what little characterization they do get uh, is told directly to the narrator Sorry, told directly to the reader from the narrator instead of being developed organically by the story, which is, I think, like the cardinal sin of fiction writing. Or I don't know. Uh, sometimes you find someone who says, actually, this isn't, this isn't actually as bad as most writing coaches make it out to be. But I, I found it annoying. For instance, we know Epicurus, sorry, we know Atticus was an Epicurean because the narrator just states that directly. Atticus was an Epicurean. Otherwise, you'd never know from the actual kind of story itself. Uh, that there's no kind of hints that come up on this in the story. Uh, the same kind of situation, Quintus Cicero. All we know about him from this novel is He's not quite as clever as his older brother, and he's more inclined towards the military and military things. Again, this is told to us directly by the narrator. It doesn't show up at all in the story. And this is it. Like, this is all the characterization Quintus Cicero gets, despite Quintus Cicero being in pretty much every scene. Now, as for the history parts, the book ends with the election of Cicero as consul. So it doesn't get into the Catiline conspiracy, all that is safe for the next book. But it is kind of setting it up. It's, it's laying the groundwork for the Catiline conspiracy. And it's setting Catiline up as a pretty nasty villain. Now I actually did my, one of my high school research papers on the Catiline conspiracy. I borrowed heavily from a book by Lester Hutchinson. Uh, in fact, I was probably much too reliant on a single source for my research paper if I was going to criticize my work as a, uh, as a researchist. But anyways, Lester Hutchins argues, uh, and I kind of copy him for my paper, that Cicero exaggerated 
or made up many of Catiline's crimes for his own historical purposes. And then a lot of these crimes afterwards kind of got recorded into history. Robert Harris, on the other hand, is not looking critically at any of this. Uh, he's taking all of Cicero's allegations against Catiline at face value and then just incorporating them in the novel, which I guess he's free to do, right? Because that's the difference between a serious history and a historical novel. In a serious history, you've got to kind of spend a lot of time analyzing uh, the conflicting accounts or kind of the historical accounts to try and get to the real truth. In a historical novel, you are free to use whichever version of history best suits your dramatic purposes. And having Catiline as a great villain sets up Cicero as a great hero, and that kind of fits your historic, that, that fits the purpose of, of a novel perfectly. Um, there's a problem, though. The problem, as Lester Hutchinson points out in his book, and as I kind of uh, reported in my research paper, if all these awful allegations about Catiline are true, then how did he manage to stay in good graces with the aristocratic Roman Senate? And this seems to be like the big problem with Robert Harris's, no Harris's novel as well. If Catiline really was a psychotic, murdering, incestuous sex fiend, how did he keep moving in the snobbiest circles of Roman aristocracy? Also, in order to preserve kind of the hero-villain dichotomy of the novel, Harris presents a view of history in which all of Cicero's enemies seem to be working in some sort of conspiracy together. For example, Clodius at one point prosecuted Catiline. Now, Clodius was one of Cicero's historical enemies. That's going to come into play in the later novels. Catiline is one of Cicero's enemies. Um, but here's a case when one of Cicero's enemies is attacking another one of Cicero's enemies. Now, you could just take the case that, okay, the world is a complex place. There are all these changing alliances. It could be that Clodius really hated Cicero, but he also really hated Catiline. Um, but that's not the view Robert Harris is, takes. Robert Harris presents this like Clodius and Catiline are engineering a show trial to boost their res respective reputations. That There's no historical evidence for that at all. He's just writing that into the novel. So in Robert Harris's version, Catiline arranged him to have himself prosecuted because he thought it would increase his popularity. Stupid. I mean, would it have been too much complexity to admit that Claudius could hate Cicero and also hate Catiline? Would, would that have been too confusing for the reader? And then it gets worse. So Harris takes the almost universally disregarded view that Caesar and Crassus were secretly funding the Catiline conspiracy. The, I mean, there is some ancient sources which have made this claim, but no historian takes this seriously. So by the time you get to the end of the book, with all these conspiracy theories going on, it, it's like you're reading the Conspiracy Theorist Nut Guide to Ancient Roman History. I mean, there, there, there's just too many conspiracy theories to take this seriously at this point. Now, I suppose some of this and the discussion it generates is all part of the fun of historical novels. But to me, it just seemed a little bit too ridiculous. All that being said, I'm looking forward to the next volume to see what Robert Harris's take on the next events are going to be. Uh, one last addendum. Um, in the book, there's some pirate attacks, uh, and the pirate attacks cause resulting panic in Rome, which then lead to Pompey getting kind of enormous military and uh, political imperial power. 
uh, and the way it's told in the book, it seems very reminiscent of the panic created by the terrorist attack in 9-11 and then the resulting expansion of government power. Now, this book came out in 2006, so this was kind of when this was still fresh on everyone's minds. As I'm reading this book, I thought, this has got to be an analogy to 9-11. Uh, and sure enough, I, I, like, I didn't need this confirmed, really. It was kind of obvious from the text itself. But I did find an interview on NPR when Robert Harris was kind of, yep, confirming this is exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to make an allusion to 9-11 and the resulting expansion of government power. Uh, it's interesting how he's able to take kind of an example from ancient history and kind of clearly show the parallels to what's going on today. It's going to date the book a little bit in the future. I mean, it already kind of has dated the book a little bit if people are still reading this kind of 20 years later, 50 years later. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting for what it is. Um, that's pretty much all I wrote here. Actually, um, sorry, as long as I've got the camera running, I'm, I'm just going to add one more thing which I didn't write here but which I should have. When Catiline was being prosecuted by Clodius, Cicero wrote in a letter to his friend Atticus that he was considering defending Catiline against the charge, uh, which is another reason why Robert Harris's version of this all being an engineered show trial doesn't completely work. Okay, uh, I'll just leave it off here.